Good morning, Wake Up HCC, Cris Oviedo with you in this beautiful Thursday morning. I am so happy that the weather has been so nice to us in the last couple of days. Uh, after my vacation, I was really, really happy to be done with the ice and just come to warm weather. <laughs> so I'm not even going to lie. And, you know, today we have a conversation that I think is just going to be as warm, as candid, and, and just bright like today is. And I have three guests with me this morning. Um, they're all English professors at Howard Community College. And I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves just in a little bit. We have two different things happening today. And I want to give you a heads up. It, the show is going to be a little bit different because um, one is an invitation. We have a great event coming up at Howard Community College. Uh, it's a lecture that you do not want to miss. Uh, but the other thing that we're doing is we're introducing a new podcast. So this show today, Live with Chris, is really half Live with Chris, half podcast. So you're going to get to see today how this podcast becomes, you know, comes to live and, and comes together um, with Sylvia Lee, Kofi Adisa, and Laura Yu. They are my guests this morning. They are joining Dragon Digital Radio with a new podcast that I think a lot of people are going to be very, very excited we have decided on a name, and the name is Bookish, a casual book club. And um, I want you guys to really present the podcast. I want you guys to present yourselves and, and, and tell us a little more about who you are. Um, I had a question here for you to tell me about your favorite book or author and what makes it your favorite. But if you want to talk about maybe the podcast in, instead of what inspired you to join this podcast we can do that as well. So I'm just going to go around, you know, based on, on who I see on my screen and Kofi, I'm, I'm going to start with you since you're the first one right next to me. So uh, <laughs> good morning and welcome. Oh, thank you. Well, um, I can tell you who my favorite author is, and that uh, was um, Ernest Gaines. And I say was because he's, he's no longer with us. Mm -hmm. um, I was reading a lot of his work. I got really... Um, inspired by his writing about the uh, parish and Louisiana. And it made me interested in more Southern literature. And so at one point in my graduate studies, on, on the way to earning my PhD, I thought, hey, I should do Southern literature since I read all of Ernest Gaines' work. And then I got a chance to meet him and he told me I should focus on my own writing and not just focus on him. And so I thought, huh. What a sage advice, because I write too. And so um, that's been one of the things that has been a driving force to my creativity and to my love of literature, um, meeting writers, talking with writers, and learning from them. So um, this podcast is cool because I get it to work with uh, two of my homies, and uh, that's always great. You know, it's... Um, I have to say, I, I, I experience... Um, the emotion because I I have had a love-hate relationship with reading throughout my life. Like I was not a big reader at, at my beginning years. And then I really discovered the love for it um, once I read a book that really spoke to my heart. And I've been becoming more of an avid reader since then. And I've had the opportunity to meet, uh, you know, or just see in a distance, I guess, really one of my authors. And I thought you only got that kind of experience and that kind of joy when you met like, you know, like like your favorite singer, like your favorite star, right? Um, but that intimate connection that you get from the books with the author and then the fact that you get to see them or you get to watch an interview and you get to see that the person you think they are is actually coming to life. It's a beautiful thing. And I love that he, this author inspired you to be who you are today and pursue a career in English. So um, I think full circle, in my opinion, right there. Yeah. <laughs> Laura, how about you? Um, let's see. Um, I think it's really, I'm, I'm always stuck about the question of who's my favorite author. <laughs> but um, I can tell you right now, and um, um, Sylvia and I and a couple of other friends, we're on this journey right now to read a lot of um, books by Asian American writers. Um, and it's that's sort of a um, group right, group of writers that are fairly new to me. And so in the last few months, um, I've been reading some short stories and novels by contemporary Asian American writers. And it's been so, you know, I have a degree in literature and 
been studying and reading literature for a long time. And this recent um, meeting of books in which I can see myself and my story or my uh, families and my friends been really eye-opening for me. So um, I would say, so not a specific author at the moment, but um, I'm really into um, these Asian American uh, writers that, that we're reading together. So um, I'm hoping maybe some of those books could make it into our book club um, conversation here. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm really looking forward to working with Kofi and Sylvia. You know, representation is one thing that I also appreciate in a book um, because Isabel Allende is one of my favorite um, mm -hmm. authors just because of that reason. She takes stories from all over the world, from different countries, and she really presents it in a way that I can so much identify with what she's writing, even though it's not my lived experience, it's my shared experience from having come in from a country like that. So I, I you know, reading has the power of doing that as well, representation. And we, a lot of times we don't think of it that way. Right. Sylvia, how about you? Oh, go ahead, Laura, sorry. No, I was, I'm sorry, I was just going to add that, you know, obviously it's awesome to meet new things and new th new places and new people that I have nothing, I have no knowledge about, but then also to see yourself in a book and to hear characters talk about things that maybe you're familiar with, um, I don't know, like brings you a little bit closer to literature in a different way. Sylvia, you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I agree with Laura on a lot of uh, a lot of what she said. Um, people ask me this question a lot, actually, when they find out like what I do or if like I'm, I'm meeting someone. They say, oh, so who's your favorite author or what should I read? And um, I'm always stuck because I feel like they expect me to say like someone epic, like Melville, you know, or something like that. But um, I. I'm kind of like a, I'm kind of like a really bad like romantic partner in the sense that like with literature in the sense that like I fall in and out of love with authors very quickly. <laughs> it's like the next author comes along and I'm like, oh, you know, and if I behave that way in any other relationship, I'd be in big trouble. But um, <laughs> so, <laughs> and yet literature affords me uh, this opportunity. So um, the pat the last time I felt that way about an author um, was probably this past summer I did a reading challenge um, and um, uh, I read a book of poetry a, uh, a day, one poetry, book of poetry a day for a month. And I met some amazing authors on that journey. And um, one of them uh, was uh, this, uh, is Carmen Jimenez Smith. And she was just like amazing, or they're just amazing. They're blowing me away with the, the um, ways in which they're creating basically like a poetic fiefdom, right? With um, these different um, experiences kind of woven together. Uh, and um, currently, you know, I am uh, rereading a lot of um, Claudia Rankin as well. And she's been, she's also a poet and um, she's just amazingly intelligent. And if you hear laughter in the background, that is my toddler giggling like a serial killer. Um, but but um, so yeah, so Claudia Rankin, she's super intelligent. And then definitely Kathy Park Hong, um, who I had the opportunity to work with a little bit in grad school, but her book, Minor Feelings, which came out in 2020. It's a nonfiction um, book. She's also a poet. Um, was just, I mean, it was, it was riveting and um, groundbreaking for an Asian American to write so candidly and so incisively about Asian American experience in America. Um, definitely, those are my three right now. Thank you for sharing all of that. I think that, you know, just with the three of you guys, I mean, we've gotten a different flavor and, and, and a different way of looking at reading. I love what you just said, Sylvia. Uh, I, I think people expect when they hear that I'm a teacher that I'm gonna be, you know, bring all of this classic names. Like that's, I think that's the idea we have of reading. It's like, we have to be in tune with the classics and the big names. And here we're listening that it's actually not so much. I mean, you have to develop that personal relationship um, maybe it's an affair relationship like Sylvia has with reading, right? Where you're jumping from maybe one genre or maybe one author or, you know, just discovering what it is that connects with you. Um, 
but I do, I do encourage everybody who's listening and watching, to just keep reading, just continue to read until you discover, you will, you will discover something that really connects with you. And that will spark, you know, that, that, that feeling, that emotion that comes and, and that joy that comes really uh, when, when you're reading a good book. Can I just say one thing about the classics? Yes. <laughs> they're, are, they're classic for a reason. Um, some of those reasons are based in white supremacy, but other reasons are that some of them are really good works and some of them really do hold up and you can find things that are enjoyable. And then there's others that are just you know, they're held up as these sort of monoliths because of the way the structures of academia and the structures of publishing work. Um, but there are some really good classics. And I think sometimes, and maybe we'll talk about this on the, on the podcast, Definitely. I think we need to interrogate what we mean by classic or, or the big works, or I think that needs to be interrogated a little bit more. So that's my two cents, sorry. <laughs> so totally that's agree. Episode, you know that's a preface for an episode coming up i think um that will be covered on our podcast and you know speaking of the pockets tell, tell us a little bit about it tell us a little bit what our listeners can expect when they connect with it and once they tune in so you can expect a lot of this you know like we talk just in you know these are our hallway chats when you know i pop into kofi's office or when i used to pre-pandemic and you know i might sit down in his chair he might sit down in mine and just be like so what is the canon? You know, <laughs> well, like you just open up these big questions, like, you know, wh who decides what the literary canon is that everyone needs to learn in high school and in college in the literature survey course, which are the, the broad kind of intro courses. And, you know, we've often had these conversations just like that. We're having them now with other literature faculty as well about, you know, um, how deeply embedded some of these racist ideas and practices have been in our literary education. I didn't read the only Asian author I ever read pre-college, and I'm talking like mid-college too, was like Amy Tan. And like, you know, no hate on Amy Tan, but like when I when the world was opened up to me that there are a lot of other, you know, Asian American female writers writing, uh, much less male, like I was blown away. And then when I took um, literature, sp specifically like, you know, um, Caribbean literature, African, it just blew my mind that they, for every Jane Eyre, there was a response, right? There was, um, you know, there was Wide Sargasso Sea or Things Fall Apart, you know, for every Conrad, there was a response. And to me, it was like finding my voice. And so I want that for, for, for students, I want that for every reader to be able to find some something of their voice. And so we're gonna, that's something that I hope we can talk about in the podcast. So just sort of these moments of like questioning, um, you know, what we're reading and why we're reading them. Um, and also we were talking about like fun stuff, like, well, to me, it's all fun, but um, you know, controversial literary opinions was a topic that we we're gonna, we <laughs> we're gonna interrogate like, you know, Kofi threw that down the gauntlet the other day when, you know, he came out with a pretty controversial literary opinion and we we're like, oh, you know, so <laughs> it's a lot of, we get a little bit rowdy when we talk about stuff like that. But. So how can our listeners be active participants of the podcast? Well, I think um, they can definitely email uh, their questions, um, comments, and I think we'll try our best to answer them um, in the next episode. And um, we were gonna have <laughs> them pick our name, but you know, we decided, yeah, no, we'll, we'll do that. Um, but yeah, it, it, we definitely want um, people to interact with us and interact with the show if they have uh, comments or commentary or questions or even ideas, you know, we definitely want to um, engage them. Now we won't, I, I can't promise we're going to, you know, answer everything, but, you know, we'll do our best. Is this podcast going to be where, you know, is, is it going to be like a book club, right? Is this going to be where uh, we're reading together a book and then we're going to, you guys are going to discuss this book in one of the podcasts. Um, tell us a little more about how that is going to work out. I think uh, we were we're what we're planning to do is maybe do a book, select a book for every other month. Um, and so that the um, 
audience can, you know, they have time to read the book and prepare so that they can listen in once the podcast episode is released. Um, so, and they can participate that way. And as they're reading the book, they could send us their comments and reflections. Um, and then um, or, or alternate that with a topic such as what about those classics, right? So we'll do a book probably every other month and then um, interlace that with an interesting question that people can uh, participate again um, through emails and comments and things like that, yeah. So it will be like a book club. <laughs> it's, it's casual, like really. It sounds like it's really uh, interactive. And, and the point here is really, um, from what I'm getting, is, is to really get people to be curious about reading, interact with you guys. I mean, I, 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 I'm going to share something that happened in, through one of our conversations um, as we were planning for, for this podcast. And Kofi said, you know, sometimes you just don't finish that book. So, you know, maybe that is your comment. Maybe you start reading a book and it just does not resonate with you. And that's the interaction that you can share, uh, you know, with our team here. You can just say, this is not a book that's speaking to me. And, I, and maybe you want to listen to the podcast because you'll find out why it is connected. And maybe you'll find out that it wasn't connected with them as well. But, you know, they chose it for a reason. Now, HTC has been providing opportunities to engage through reading and share experiences through the Howard County Book Connection since 2003. Can you guys tell us briefly what the Book Connection is and how it works? Um, the Book Connection is a uh, partnership between Howard Community College and Howard County Poetry and Literature Society. And what we do is every year there's a committee of, of um, diverse group of people on campus who select a book for the campus. Um, and you would find these books perhaps in various courses on campus. So often they're very interdisciplinary um, kind of a book. Um, and then we also then through Hoko Polizzo, um, then communicate that out to the community. So the students and staff and faculty are reading it on campus and hopefully getting the message out to the community as well. Um, and we try to select the book by no, let me, let me amend that. We do select books by living authors um, because one of the key um, things about book connection, I think is connection with the author. So we try to bring, a, bring the author um, onto campus um, this year virtually um, so that uh, the readers can have, um, hear from the author and have interaction with them. So, and this year what's um, new, I guess, is that the author event is supported by the Bowder Lecture Series, which is in its inaugural year. Um, and uh, the Bowder Lecture Series basically supports the bringing of the author of the Book Connection book. Um, and it is supported by Dr. Lillian Bowder, who is a Columbia resident and a, and a leader in the community. So we're so thankful for her support so that we can um, bring authors to campus and well and virtually and 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 the event is open to not only HCC folks but also to the community so um, and that event is on March 4th at 12 p.m for Black uh, Friday Black <laughs> and you know I have to say I had the opportunity to, to attend one of the lectures I want to say two years ago um, a book that I had not heard of, a book that I had not read before or anything like that. I went into the lecture just because I had some time in my hands and it, it just felt, it just felt really interesting. And I was blown away. I was blown away, you know, when I heard it was uh, for the book, uh, A Chance in the World. And I was blown away when I walked into this um, auditorium and I had the author right there and he shared his experience and he read from the book. It was really, really powerful. Uh, if you haven't read the book, I, I encourage you to go and, and, and read it. It's, um, it talks about um, the story of a child who has a really rough um, bring up, but then yet he continues to be just hopeful and, and find his way, you know, um, but what it, what it really spoke to me, and, and this is why I like reading, is that it really opened my eyes to how things work in the system of um, here in the United States when a child um, loses his parents or goes into the system and falls into foster care and things like that. So I had no experience. I didn't grow up in this country. I heard about the system, but I 
didn't really understand it until I read the book. And, you know, this is one example. And I know that in many cases it works well, but this is an example of how it can also disturb some people. So very powerful to meet the person, very powerful to hear from him, his experiences, his stories, and then the message that he brought for everyone who was in that auditorium that day um, of hope, right? Of hope or of just, you know, no matter how hard life is, and he has had a really rough upbringing um, to just keep moving forward and finding those people around you who can lift you up. Um, I find a lot of value in, in this lectures and I am so appreciative that HEC is doing the Bowder Lectures is gonna be an annual event. Um, that's the commitment through this grant. Yes. And this year is virtual, which in a way it's, in a way, you know, I know that we're in this virtual world and we're finding some good things and some bad things about that, right? I think it's gonna be intimate. I think it's gonna open up opportunities for people who maybe couldn't come to HCC before uh, because of their schedule or whatever to actually access this at their lunch break. Um, so everybody's invited Thursday, March 4th at 12 p.m. You have to pre-register for the event. I will be putting the link where you can pre-register on our comments from this conversation. Um, so that you can then obtain the link to log into that conversation. And Chris, I want to just add that um, I, I think maybe some misconception about going to author readings or talks is that like you have to read the book before you go. And in fact, I think sometimes when you go to the talk and you learn about the book and learn about the author and listen to the author in interview with, uh, um, with another person, for example, like this is going to be, um, then I think, and then going to read the book can also be great too. So I hope, you know, people listening don't feel like, oh, I can't go to that. I don't have time to read the book by then. I hope they come and then learn about the book and then go read it. <laughs> yeah. Which was my experience. I had never heard of the book before. And then I bought it as I was coming out of the event and I read it. <laughs> yeah. So absolutely. So just to remind everybody again, the Bowder lecture is happening online on Thursday, March the 4th at 12 p.m. Free register so you can get your link. The lecture is gonna be centered around the book Friday Black by Nana Kwame Ajay Brenia. And I'm going to, you know, this is, this is kind of like the half point where the Life with Chris shows stops for today and it becomes Bookish a Castle Book Club. So guys, um, I'm just gonna step back I'm going to bring you all on screen and um, just take it away. <laughs> wow, now we start our podcast. Yay! <laughs> so Casual let me book club. Here. There no. it is, people. Friday yeah. Black, not to be confused with Black, Black Friday. Friday. Although it is, a, it is if it's a play on that, um, for sure. But um, I, okay, so... While I'm while while I read a book, oftentimes I'm texting with Laura or Kofi or our other friends, um, depending on what we're reading, and we're like, "Oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> like this part, this part is killing me," or like, "What about this?" or you know, and um, I really had to refrain from texting you guys, like my thoughts on the my my live commentary on the book while I was <laughs> reading the book. <laughs> if only you knew how much I have spared you from my. Yeah, I just I, I don't want to spoil things for um, people who might be interested in reading the book, um, but it is really it's really captivating, and it it's probably not the type of collection of short stories that I think a lot of people would readily gravitate to, um, because it's it's somewhat surreal and absurdist in a way, mm -hmm. um, but it's also very poignant and. It's um, the stories seem funny, but yet there's something serious and there's something dark and yet witty um, about the book. And I, 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 well, this collection of short stories. So I would, just, I would recommend the book. I would definitely recommend it. I tend not to recommend books, um, especially if I'm like, eh, it's okay. Um, but this is really interesting. And I think one of the things that I like about the book that I don't think I'm giving too much weight on is there are stories that are about issues, but the stories are about writing and being a creative writer. Yes. And I think that those stories are 
that resonate more with me. Um, and in fact, I think sometimes when I'm looking at books that are written by people who have MFAs, they almost always have some um, story that deals with being a writer. And I always find that a, tr a treat. Well, so one of the texts I was going to send you, Kofi, was what is the fiction equivalent of an Ars Poetica? Because in poetry, you know, we have these poems called Ar uh, Ars Poetica and you, it's a po poem about poetry, right? So you kind of get a little bit meta yeah. and um, like the, one of the most famous ones is Marianne Moore's poem, Poetry. <laughs> And her first line in that poem is, I too dislike it. You know, um, it's kind of like responding to a lot of people who are like, ah, I just don't get poetry, I don't like it. And so her first line is disarming, is like, I too dislike it. And this is a poet. But in one of the short stories, I, and I'm wondering if it's the hospital where, if it's that story um, that you're talking about. As Yeah, that's one of them. One of them, yeah. And as I was reading it, I was like, what's the, what's the fiction equivalent of an Ars Poetica? Because... I feel like for that story in particular, I mean, obviously the main, the, you know, the narrator is actually writing in that story, but the, the, the way in which, the way in which that story plays out and kind of the, the metaphors that are given and applied to writing, I'm trying to like dance around some of the major plot points, um, really made me think about you know, that particular thing too, Kofi, the idea of writers who are writing about the craft of writing. Yeah, I don't know if there is a fiction equivalent. I think there are fiction writers um, like William, William Gass, I'm thinking about with the tunnel. Um, he's writing a book about writing a book. <laughs> and and then sort of like the, the journey of that. And there have been a lot of like French writers who do that. Um, you know, now I'm about to sound like a PhD student. So, <laughs> let, so bear with me. Um, you know, sort of like the French existential writers, like a lot of their, their works were really about them, but then also about the greater society at all. Uh, so like Camus, um, Sartre, mm -hmm. and even um, Andre Milwaukee, you know, there's like all these different sort of French writers. Um, sorry, sorry. I hope people don't get turned off. <laughs> but, you know, it's like a lot of the things that we're reading now, you can find that they're troping or they are, see, I'm using words like troping. Um, <laughs> they, they are like, echoes of other writers that more than likely they've studied or have been exposed to um, in some way, shape or form. But again, I don't know if there is a, if there is a fiction, I, I haven't heard of it yet. Well, I think in hospital, what is it called? Hospital where? Mm -hmm. yeah. right? so in terms of that story, um, it comes in like about a third way into the book. And so after a few couple of these really shocked shocking stories, especially the first story, Finkelstein, the Finkelstein Five, then, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden I felt like I was seeing the writer mm -hmm. writing this book in the hospital. Um, and, and I think that is the beauty of a collection of short stories too about the shifting perspectives, mm -hmm. right? And so suddenly after a couple of these uh, stories, I'm looking at the author. I, I felt like the main character was the author. Um, and, you know, I, over the years, I've trained as a reader to not do that, to, you mm -hmm. don't want to equate the narrator with the author. But in that story, you, he's, all, I feel like he's almost as asking you to do that. Right. So that, that I wanted to ask a question about what do you think about the, um, and I think we touched on this in prior conversation, like the structure of short stories, right? So why is, for example, the Finkelstein Five, Yes. the first story and you know Zimmerland comes later and then why is you know light spitter where light spitter is and so on because those are not accidental obviously right the author is very intentional about those things and without trying to read the author's mind what what is the effect I guess would be the question of the current structure of this particular collection 
I thought about that a lot as I was as I was reading it. I think about that a lot. I think with every short story collection, uh, mm -hmm. even poetry collection, where you have like that are not um, like you know one long sustained poem. But um, I think the tendency is to want to search for connection, you know, between the stories, and sometimes it's there. And I and I think it's intentional the ordering of the story. But you know, I, I wrote the. You guys read, I wrote up a little descriptive blurb for Friday Black for our Pathways magazine. And in it, you know, I realized, you know, Finkel scene five is I think the story that kind of like punches the hardest um, in the very beginning. It's the story where I, you know, I, and I wrote in the blurb, like from the very first lines, I feel like the author is almost issuing a challenge. You know, will you, will you look, are you going to continue on? Are you going to, you gonna turn away and it's almost like this is not for the faint of heart, you know? And so what I take that to mean for myself as a reader is the idea of, I was, I was linking it to the idea of, um, of, of allyship and witness, you know, and especially right now where you have a lot of people decrying a lot of the, you know, racist attacks that we're seeing, you know, um, around us, I, I think it's, it's, it's easier to, to decry these, these attacks, but it's harder to look and actually see what we've done to ourselves. Um, and so, and, and it's because it's very raw and it's very visceral. And a lot of the reaction I get from about this book that I've been hearing has been, oh, it's, it's really graphic or it's very violent and um, it's a little upsetting. I, I, you know, can't, and I understand there's like, you know, trauma that some people might trigger as they're reading it. But I also at the same time think there are some things we have to really look at. And I feel like it's a challenge that he's challenging us to look at these things um, that we've done and not turn away from it. And um, I see it in Finkelstein 5. And I also see it in um, uh, Lark Street as well. Um, and, but, uh, you know, and, and layered on that, I, I find that there is a, a sense of you know, when you actually look, you're not just seeing the violence, but you're seeing at the at the bottom of it. And this is why I stuck with the the, the collection is that there's like a there's like a, a hope and a humanity that sort of like lifts you out of it. And so it's never I'm never like left in that pit of like despair <laughs> and like violence. But there's always like a there's always something, you know, and it it really is. It, it really, to me, it was really inspirational in that sense, oddly, even though it was kind of um, brutal. And the author gives you little breaks too. So he pairs like, he'll he'll do like what? Finkelstein Five and then um, uh, The Era, which was also like, to me, the a big story in that collection. Um, and then mm -hmm. either before or after that, he gives you a little break with like these like one page stories or two page stories. And that one page story, Things My Mother Said. Uh-huh. Oh man, I was like, how dare you? How dare you do that to me? I'm like, mess with my emotions like that, you know? Uh, but it's just these sweet, like bittersweet, but sweet moments um, that, that he presents and he kind of like, just like inserts in there. So that's my- Yeah, just to kind of build on that, um, Sylvia and audience, um, it's the idea of looking and seeing, and it's, it's not just what you look at, but what you see when you look at it. And what do you try to avoid to see? And I think that the, the beauty of the book is that when you're reading, you know, reading, you know, taps into your mind and you get visual images and all of those great things. But now it's like stark because we have a culture and a history that is in front of us. We have a time that is in front of us. And so, um, you know, the first story, you know, I thought about um, the exonerated five, you know, I thought about a lot of people who were decapitated in a different kind of way and stripped from um, their, their homeland, their, their, their culture. And so I think there's like such depth to a lot of these stories that you can look and read and understand the story all as, it's, as it is. But then there's something beyond that. And I think that that's the part that is intriguing and inviting and it keeps you going. Because if you're, I mean, if you're a novice reader, some of the stories might just seem bizarre and that's okay. 
Um, I think most of them are very entertaining. So I think that that's okay too. But if you're an avid reader, you will begin to see certain patterns, I think. And those patterns will harken to things that are political, social, cultural, and all of those things are important and impactful and I think meaningful in, in, in a real way. Um, so looking and seeing are definitely themes, uh, I think embedded in a lot of the stories. And I also thought Lark Street was about writing. I did too, Kofi. Yeah. And, I, and I was like, is it, is it okay that I think that? <laughs> No, I, I, I had this uh, I had this this moment and, and again I don't want to ruin ruin the thing for for well people. I think you can give a premise of what the what Lark Street is about and then and then tell us what, what you I see. Know, I feel like I'm, writing. I'll do it. I'll do it. Well, like mild I'm, spoiler alert people. Um, but you know in, in Lark Street you <laughs> you have a it's it's basically two aborted fetuses talking to their father who was uh, integral in the decision to abort them. And so um, that's what we mean where, you know, we say it's not like for some of, some of these stories, you know, they will, it, like, this is what Kofi means. I, you know, this is what I'm taking as sort of, if you don't look beyond and see, right. And choose to see that um, it will be just about what it is. Um, but to me, that was about writing too, as because I think you and I, you know, we as practicing writers, we we think about these things a lot. I was actually hoping that one wasn't about writing, but like I, I was hoping that like it was just me because I didn't want it to be about writing, and yet it, it was sort of it was sort of fitting, you know, the idea um, that you know writing as act of creation, as as act of a, a generative act, and the things that you create are precious to you, and I think. There's nothing more powerful than that feeling that you've created something, you know, but. <laughs> Some but, of that stuff you created, you're gonna have to get rid of. <laughs> yes. Um, and it's some of the things you don't wanna get, you know, you don't want to, and some, you can't wait. You're like, all right, you yeah. know, or some things it's just not, you want it to work out and it just doesn't work out. I'm actually experiencing that right now, Laura, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, you want things to work out and it's just not working out and I have to accept that. Um, I, to you know, that's a really good, that's a really good, I don't think I read that story as a, I don't think I read that story as a, as a writer, right? I guess that's my, you know, I didn't have that hat on or perspective on. Um, but I, but I think that question about like what's beyond the story. So if somebody asks you, hey, what's that story about? And if it's only about aborted fetuses, like that does not sound like a story that a lot of people want to read. And that, that's one of the stories that turn, could be turn people off. But then, you know, get into it and you think about like, I, I mean, there are lots of different topics that could come, come out of that, right? Um, and you have to see something in it, in the story that, that you can take away from it. And for you to, it was the sort of uh, maybe a metaphor for, for writing. That's yeah, I mean, it, yeah. I, I think so. Oh. And, and then the hospital where comes immediately afterwards. Yeah, so it yeah. Feels like this sort of ghost of deleted um, precious children is now rebirthed in I'm going to create a situation um, with uh, the hospital where, and I think that there's there's something to that. Now, you know, the author would probably say, "No, it's none of that," and that's <laughs> fine. Um, but I, I, <laughs> I really, like, no, you're way off. It's before the lecture. Nah. Yeah. I did. I did hear that. Um, I was in a, another book club where we talked about this book, and and someone shared that they read that while some people read Lark Street as a um, pro-life, like pro-life uh, position story, like, you know, like being against abortion or something, because, you know, the assumption is that the story is supposed to horrify you. So, mm -hmm. you know, these are aborted fetuses. But, but then apparently the author, um, don't quote me on this, but apparently the author had said, no, that's, that's not it. <laughs> so I think uh, that question of like, well, yeah, what is it? <laughs> like, what is it, and what is it doing beyond the thing that it's about on the surface? Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm, 
I'm curious how lots of different people read that story if they can read the story. You know? Yeah, I can see why some people would come to that interpretation though, yeah. because yeah. It's, it's being haunted and being terrified. But then you got to reconcile going to, you know, some of the ex extremes that happen within the story that wouldn't necessarily fit, um, you know, sort of the mysticism behind a lot of it, I think is, um, May, may undercut some of that the, that interpretation, right. but I definitely it it does go back to what is it that you are looking at and what is it that you either want to see or you think you see, um, and I you know I I find all of the stories fascinating in that regard, um, and I think it also in each story how you feel about it I think depends on which character you align with. You're, you're, you align yourself with or see through, through the, uh, see the events through. So for example, I think Finkelstein five, where the, you know, the premise being, the, uh, the, that story was a reaction to the um, Zimmerman verdict, um, mm -hmm. Trayvon Martin case. And um, I, I think the, if you are aligning yourself with the narrator or the main character in the story, who's on this verge of possibly committing violence um, against supposedly, you know, innocent people. Um, and in that moment, I paused and thought like, wait, who am I rooting for here? <laughs> like, am I rooting for this person who is enraged, right? And is feeling hurt and suffering and the injustice and seeking justice and all that. And I, I align myself with that character but then of course you're looking sort of down also at the two innocent people who are begging for their lives. And, you know, do they deserve to be, you know, um, harmed or whatever. So I wonder in that moment or just throughout the book, like it, I think the impact of the story and how horrible it is mm -hmm. or in what ways it's horrible to the reader depends on who you relate to in the story. Um, so again, like that whole idea of like the reader bringing half of the experience to the book, right? It, it's not just all already prepackaged in the book. It's what I bring, what you bring to the book that's going to yield a different um, reading experience, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm also curious, like I, maybe, maybe it's sort of tied to that, Laura, the idea of like, as a reader, the, the things that you're bringing in with you when you're reading something. But this collection specifically, the titles of the stories, um, some of them actually were, were, were really interesting to me, like the idea of um, the, the way that he's using titles to sort of almost mimic some of the headlines we see. And in some ways, I think, like, for example, you can't, you can't get away from the similarities of the story Zimmerland, uh -huh. and, you know, Zimmerman and like the, the premise of the story and what it's like, you know, this, uh, which I found to be like, that was one of the harder stories for me to read, I think, just because of the, the way, which surprised me because like, I think if you were to read it, it's not one of the harder, like Large Street might be harder for some people, but for me, Zimmerman right. was a little bit more difficult um, because I feel like Zimmerland was one of the stories where he kind of captures this, like the feeling of being trapped within this like intersection of racism and capitalism and like commercialism and consumerism. And I felt that that was like a, that was the other layer of the book for me that was really, um, really interesting. So like up until Friday, so, so I believe Zimmerland comes before Friday Black, but up until Friday Black, there's like, you know, like a different types of stories about you know, different, ranging on different, you know, plot lines and things like that. But I felt like once Fr I read Friday Black, which is the title story, and that the book kind of takes a shift. So I guess going back to the idea of the sequencing too, the book kind of takes a shift. So I would like categorize the stories as before and after Friday Black, because after Friday Black, I saw much more of the uh, continuity of characters through like into different stories. So like, you know, you would have some of the characters that showed up in Friday Black showing up again you know, from their perspective in, in one of the subsequent stories. And then the, the shift of it becoming a lot more um, 
like rooted in one specific area of our capitalist systems, you know, like in retail, for example. Um, But yeah, to me, like these, like, that's what I, I I was, I was, I felt like I was almost baited, like invited to like make these connections of, which you should be, right? It's literature um, of like, you know, George Zimmerman and, you know, even like the Finkelstein Five is playing on these, you know, ideas of, um, was it the Central Park Five? Like, it's just all these things that are kind of um, inviting us to, to talk about Friday, Friday Black instead of Black Friday. I feel like he's, he's creating almost this like um, mirror society, right? This, this dystopian society, but it's our society. And yet there's elements of like futurism in there. And there's elements of like, it's like the, it's like the Netflix show Black Mirror. Is that what it's called? Mm-hmm. Um, similar to that, where it's like our society, but yeah. Just yeah. slightly like tilted. Um, so I, I was curious about what you guys thought about the titles and, and the way that it plays out in the book. I, I'm still trying to make sense of some of the titles. Um, so I, I'm not necessarily sure I can answer your question, uh, Sylvia, because Lark Street really doesn't fit for me as a title. Um, so there's there were some times I thought, huh, is that a good title? Um, well, a lark, and that's just sings, a lark sings, a lark song. Oh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I, yeah, that's that's pretty good. Uh, that's not convincing me, but yeah, <laughs> that's 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 pretty good. Uh, that's your poetic license. I get it, um, but but I think that. Um, it, titles are tricky because sometimes they mean something and they could actually mean nothing. Um, and, I, you know, I just found it, it, I just found some of the titles just like, huh. What about, what about light, light Spitter? Oh, I love light that Light Spitter. <laughs> That's hard to say, actually. <laughs> yeah, I like, I like that title, actually. I like it for another reason, though. Um, it sounds very hip hopish, you know, um, and I like that, um, you know. So, like a, a spitter in hip hop is someone who can really rap well and has lyrical abilities, mm. and so I think, in in many ways, there's some of that there too. You know, there are, yeah. there's just such, there's just such layering there that I think for a reader to come into this book, um, I think he or she or they will find stories that they enjoy. Um, one thing I will say, and um, I know we're running out, getting close to time. Um, with story collections, you shouldn't treat them like novels. Like you have to read chapter to chapter. It's almost better to try to read a story in the middle of the book in a collection, uh-huh. um, especially if they're not necessarily interconnected. Um, and even when they are, the, the idea is that a short story should stand on its own as its own. And so I think one of the wonderful things about st- short story collections um, is that you can pick up a short story, read it, and then come back and pick up something else. It's almost like you have this newspaper with all these sections that you don't have to start with the front page. You can go to the sports section. You can go to the style section or something like that. So, Is that what I, you did? Is that what you did with this one? Yeah, but I did it because I of writing and I like to see the writing and how it changes um, and the narrative techniques. Um, and, and But I'm not going to get into the critical part of what I think about the book because I, I, I don't want to discourage folk. Well, I read the first half of the book in order okay. and then I read the second half backwards because I was told that the last story was like this big, like, oh, the you know, there was a hard one to read and a lot of people had a lot of strong reaction to it so I definitely wanted to read the last one so then the second half I read backwards starting with the last story and that was interesting too I think you know um, Sylvia you talked earlier about like even though the book feels heavy and there's yes violence and hard topics and issues there's a sense of like uplifting and tenderness. And, and I do think the very, so this is like, I'm trying to entice people to read it. <laughs> the last line of the last story, I think there is a sense of ho- hope or something good um, at the end of a very terrible story, you know? 
well, throughout the whole, like each story, I feel like I see people, what I appreciate about his writing is that it gives me a, a sense, and this is true to what I see around, around me, is that people are capable of horrible things, but also the same people have some goodness in, like they are also capable of good things, you know, and it's a really hard tension to, to navigate um, that someone can make such a terrible decision and yet, you know, at the same time be a human, like a full human and, you know, have compassion and be capable of that. Um, I think we tend to want to write off people who have done terrible things as, as a one and done. But I, I think that part of the choosing to see is that he, he kind of requires us to do that. I actually read, I, with, with short story collections, Kofi, I tend to read the title story first. So I read Friday Black ah. first. Yeah, and because I'm like, it's the title for a reason. Uh, so like, and, you, and every time I do that, I am not disappointed, you know, cause I'm like, all right, that's why it's the title story. Um, so like I, I, I did it with it. There's another short story collection called Sour Heart by Jenny Zhang. Um, and her title story, I believe, is the first story too. And I understand why it's the first story because it's just crazy. Like that first sentence is a page long and it's like, it's nuts. Um, <laughs> like, what am I reading? But- um, I, Wait, what is it called again? I want to read that. Um, it's called Sour Heart by Jenny. Sour Heart. Oh. Yeah, so it looks like. Okay. Um, and with Friday Black, I read Friday Black first and then I read the subsequent couple stories after and then I s skipped over to the front of the book and then I started reading it that way. Um, and it was really, it was, it was a journey. It was interesting. I think that's a great point for me to come back into the conversation and stop the podcast recording. Um, for everybody watching, this is, this is how we do it. I guess you guys got to see a live production of the podcast. Usually I do turn my camera off and my microphone off, but I thought that would be a little weird today. <laughs> so I was just there. Maybe it was even weirder to just have me staring there in the corner. But <laughs> this is, you know, this is this is how podcasts are produced here at our station. I'm really glad you guys get to see um, some of the process of, of live behind the scenes look of what happens at Dragon Digital Radio. Thank you guys for, for doing that. Um, I just want to elevate the, the, the lecture again. I'm not going to talk about the book because I have so many questions. I haven't read the book. I am planning on going to the lecture, lit, hearing from the, you know, because I had such a great experience doing that before. Like Laura said, you know, many times you might feel intimidated going into a lecture because you haven't read the book. I encourage you to do it. I did it not knowing what I was doing. And I'm so glad <laughs> I did that because it inspired me to read this book after hearing, you know, the, the, the thinking behind, the, the logic behind, the, the stories behind, uh, and in the case of the book that, that I read, just the inspiration and, and the, the life story the, of, of the author and what inspired him to write that book. So I wanna connect with that first. I've read about the book. I have an idea of, of what the book is about. Um, and after he, <laughs> listening to your conversation, I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> this is this sounds really 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 exciting um but I don't know that I have the stomach to read through conversations like the ones you just mentioned so the Bowder lecture it's March Thursday March the 4th is just a week from today 12 p.m I will be putting the link where you can register to get the link uh thank you again to Dr. Lillian Bowder for her generous contribution to make this an annual event. Is there anything else you guys want to add before we wrap our conversation up today? Tune in to our podcast. <laughs> yeah, tune in. Tune in. There's lots more fun stuff to come and yeah, send us any questions or uh, topic suggestions or things you've always wanted um, to talk about and uh, hopefully you can discover your next great read too. I think you guys were able to witness and feel the passion just like I did. And and the one thing that I do want to say is that I love how really casual it is, right? Like really making honor to the name is like, we've read the book, we're going to have a conversation, have some ideas. But then, I mean, you guys just shared a book right there. Like, oh, wait, wait, what was that book again? I want to read that, right? I mean, that's, right. and I personally love that about it. So 
become part of this conversation, become part of this group of this reading book and get inspired, um, you know, to read things that maybe you wouldn't pick up on your own because like, if you're like me, you're exploring and getting and becoming, trying to become a better reader. That's one of the hardest things, deciding on what do I read next? How do I know what to read, what books I should be looking into, what I'm going to connect with and having, having, you know, this, this kind of opportunity where you can hear from somebody who's read the book and can tell you and talk about it. Maybe we'll be like, okay, that sounds like a book I want to pick up and I want to read and I want to spend some time on. So thank you guys so much. Really appreciate it. Everyone again invited Thursday, March the 4th at 12 p.m. The for the Bowder lecture happening virtually, Howard Community College. You get this uh, rare opportunity to interact with a New York Times bestselling author, Nana Kwame Ajay Brania. So make sure you tune in. I will be putting the link shortly. Have a wonderful rest of your Thursday and stay tuned. DragonDigitalRadio.podbean.com is where you can find the new podcast, Bookish, a casual book club. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Chris.